السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. same way he gathered us today in his house in this dunya. Ameen. Tayyib. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa afdalu salati wa atamu taslim ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Nabiya al-Ummiya al-Ameen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'ina amma ba'd. Ahbab al-Mustafa alayhi salatu wa salam after the Eid holidays which lined up with the Canada Day long weekend and also the camping trip for the community. We are back in the Masjid, alhamdulillah, and we are here to continue with our reflections on the fiqh of salah. Specifically, we have a goal to help us all, inshallah, to be more connected and to be more attentive in our salah so that we can gain more from our salah, so that we can be more mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during our salah. And just as a very quick recap, we discussed many things. We spoke for a few weeks about wudu and tahara. After that, we spoke about the preconditions of salah, how to prepare for salah. And then we started to talk about the meanings of what we recite in salah. And we reached until a point where we were studying the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha, which we read in every raka'ah of every salah. Let's go over the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha quickly, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the first chapter of the Qur'an, He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praises and thanks belong to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. The Lord of everything. Just some footnotes for you guys to enjoy, inshallah. When we say Alhamdulillah, all praise and thanks belong to Allah, just something for us to think about. You know, somebody, just as an example, Brother Ned is not here, I think he went to visit our neighbor. But Brother Ned, mashallah, may Allah bless him, whenever I come into the message, he asks me, ma'am, do you want coffee? And whether I say yes or no, he says I can have it ready in a couple of minutes. It's easy, it's a piece of cake. Obviously, he makes the coffee and then I say thank you. But subhanAllah, if you think about it, for Brother Ned to be able to make that coffee that I drink and all of you drink, how many things need to happen that are in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Any idea? Somebody might think Ned has to get the coffee, put it in the coffee maker, hit the power button, that's it. But way more than that. We say Alhamdulillah because in essence, anything that I enjoy, anything that you can do, that I can do, before we can do that, there is so much that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that makes it possible for us to do that. Let's go back to the example of Brother Ned and his coffee. For Brother Ned to make the coffee, he has to be alive, right? For Brother Ned to make the coffee, we need power, we need electricity. For Brother Ned to make the coffee, we need water. For Brother Ned to make the coffee, this building has to exist, it can't be destroyed. For Brother Ned to make the coffee, his hands have to work, his hands have to move. His eyes have to be functional. His mind has to be alert. For Brother Ned to make the coffee, we have to have oxygen around us so he can breathe and move from place to place and do what he has to do. You guys get the idea. I can go on and on and on. But something so simple as making a cup of coffee, there is a million and one things that Allah is doing in that moment to make it possible for someone to make a cup of coffee. 
And this is really what we think about when we say Alhamdulillah. It's not Alhamdulillah, I have coffee or I have water to drink. When you say Alhamdulillah, you think of everything that Allah is doing behind that cup of coffee to make it possible for you to have that cup of coffee. You know, for me and you to enjoy a beautiful summer day like today, it was beautiful earlier, and then it started raining. I was out of town. Alhamdulillah, we enjoyed our afternoon. Um, it was sunny, it was beautiful, and then it started raining. We head home, headed home, and then got dressed and came to the masjid. But for us to enjoy the beautiful weather, how many things did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of before me and my family were able to go somewhere, enjoy you know, a lovely afternoon, the sun has to be there, the weather has to be right, the water temperature has to be you know, warm enough for us to enjoy, the air around us has to be there for us to breathe, the trees have to be alive to provide us with shade, the roads that we drive on have to have existed, the earth that we are traveling on has to be maintained. All of this is happening. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking care of it without any effort from me, without any effort from you. And this is why we say Alhamdulillah for everything. Because in essence, nothing can happen unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing it. I'm saying one million and one things because it's a number we can't imagine. But it's more than that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking care of so many different things to make sure you and I can do what we do in life. So this is the meaning of Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Rabb, He is the Lord of Alameen. What, what is Alameen? We explained all of this before. This is just some footnotes for us to enjoy. The word Alam in the Arabic language comes from the, the meaning, the original meaning of the word is a sign. So till today, Alama is a sign or a marker for something. In the Arabic language, you know, the punctuation marks they call alamat al-tarkhim. Like question mark, exclamation mark, all these things, they're called alamat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of alameen. His creation, he called it alameen. Why? Because everything that Allah created is a sign for me and you to recognize him subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the beauty of the Arabic language, that there are root words and there are meanings for why words are formed and coined. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed his Qur'an that he said in Arabi and Mubin in a clear Arabic tongue, in a clear Arabic language. So that me and you, even though we're not Arab, when we study the meaning of Qur'an, we can get deep into the meaning and understand what it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended. So Allah talks about all the things he created. It's not just the word that Allah created everything. But Allah created everything and everything he created is a sign for me and you to know of his existence. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is Ar-Rahman and He is Ar-Rahim. And we explained this in a little bit of detail. Allah is most merciful to all His creation and He is also specifically merciful to the righteous and to those who believe. This is essential as I explained to you guys before because imagine if Allah was only Ar-Rahman and the attributes of Ar-Rahim wasn't applicable to Allah, then Hasharillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, somebody claimed that he is unjust. Because, you know, whether it's Fir'aun or someone like Hitler versus me and you, all of us enjoyed the mercy of Allah. All of us breathed, all of us, our eyes worked, our hands worked, our aql works. Then how could it be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful to everyone, irrespective of their crimes and their, you know, wrongdoings? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful to all his creation here in this world. In the next world, in the akhirah, Allah will treat people and he will deal with them according to their deeds. If you believed and acted righteously, you will be treated kindly. And if you disbelieved or acted in an evil and in a wrong way, then you will be punished and you will have to pay the compensation for your deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Malik, or He is Malik, Yawm al-Deen. There are multiple qiraat, variations of reciting this ayah. I'm not going to open a can of worms. But in the riwayah of the Qur'an that we are all familiar with, we read Malik, Yawm al-Deen. In a different qiraat, they read Malik, Yawm al-Deen. In the riwayah of Imam Warsh from Nafi, 
which is predominantly recited in the North African region of the world until today, they read slightly differently. They say, Maliki Yawm al -Din. Both versions of the ayah, both recitations of the ayah, complement the meaning of the other. On one hand, Allah is the king of the Day of Judgment. On the other hand, Allah is the owner of everything and the master of the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is both king and an owner. You see, in this dunya, you have kings as well. We don't need to be specific, but there are kings alive in the world until today. However, Brother Ned, we were just talking about it. The whole halaqa was about you and coffee. You missed it. Um, in the world today, we have kings that live. But kings don't own everything. A king can be the king of the land. He can be the king of the country. She can be the queen of the you know, country. But they don't own everything. Not all the resources of the country are available to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different. He is not just a king who has a title. He is not just a royal figure. Allah owns everything. Everything belongs to Allah. Allah mentions in the Quran that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask a question. He will say, الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ Who owns everything today? To whom belong everything today? All of you and everything that you owned and everything that you had as a possession. Who is the owner of all of that today on the day of judgment? Nobody will say a word. So Allah will answer himself. He will say, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدُ الْقَهَارِ All of it belongs to Allah, the one and alone, the one who overpowers everyone else. So this is Maliki Yawm al-Din. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You alone do we worship. We tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you alone do we worship and you alone do we seek help from. It's important for us to appreciate that in the Arabic language, it could have been enough. We could have said, Na'buduka wa nasta'inuk. This is a correct statement, this is a correct phrase. Allah could have taught us to say, Na'buduka wa nasta'inuk. But Allah didn't teach us to say that. Allah taught us to say, Iyaka na'bud wa Iyaka nasta'in. What's the difference? They would mean almost the same thing. But when we say, Iyaka na'bud, we are telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you alone do we worship. Somebody could worship, you know, in different religions, may Allah protect us. They can have multiple gods and there's no problem. We worship this one today, we worship that one tomorrow. What's the big deal? But in the religion of Islam, we have only one Allah that we worship. And there's nobody else who deserves our worship. So we say, we don't only say that we worship Allah. It is you alone, Allah, that we will worship. And you alone do we seek help from. Let's break this down a little bit. When we say that we worship Allah, we do ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iyaka na'bud. Na'bud, we worship. Worship meaning ibadah. What is ibadah? Simple definition of ibadah of Imam Islam. They say, al-ibadah to ma'naha ta'a. Worship of Allah means to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To worship Allah doesn't just mean, you know, not you guys, mashallah, because we studied ibadah in a lot of details. I think my first, if not my first, maybe my second halaqa here in the masjid was about ibadah and the meaning of ibadah. And this was part of the series when we talked about the Muslim community that we dream of. And we said we dream of a community that their goal is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to do ibadah. And we broke it down and explained what ibadah means. So not you guys, but some other people, if you talk ibadah, the first thing comes to their mind is salah, zakah, hajj, fasting. Taban, this is part of ibadah. As a matter of fact, I'll share with you guys something very cool and very interesting that I uh, found very beneficial on Friday. Today is Saturday, so that was yesterday. Yesterday I attended Khutbah al Jumu'ah and I listened to my honorable teacher, may Allah bless him, Shaykh Hashraf, he was giving the khutbah. And among the things that he was talking about was the concept of ibadah. And let me explain it to you the way that he did. This is not my idea or my words, I am simply repeating and parroting exactly as he said. He gave a beautiful analogy. And he said, you know, imagine somebody had a car. Imagine somebody had a car. 
the car that you own, it could be any kind of car. Let's use my favorite car. That'll be the latest model of the Honda Accord. I am a avid Honda fan. I love Hondas. Accords, not Civics. I drive a Civic occasionally. It's not my car. It's my mother's house car. But the Honda Accord, somebody has the latest model of the Honda Accord. You need to maintain that car. At the basic level, you need to put gas in that car, right? When the time comes, you need to change the oil in that engine. After a little while passes, you need to service your brakes. There might be other you know, little maintenance things, hiccups that come up here and there. You have to maintain this car. The rituals that we perform, the salah, the fasting, the zakah, the hajj, is like the maintenance of the car. One more time, the salah, the zakah, the fasting, the hajj, the dhikr, the recitation of the Qur'an is like the maintenance of the car. Did you ever see in your life somebody who bought a brand new car to maintain it, just to maintain it, parked the car in the driveway and said, Wallah, I did the oil change. And the Wallah, I put gas, tank is full. And inshallah, tomorrow I will change the brakes. Can this be an achievement? You will look, you say, the guy is insane. Habibi, have you driven the car? No, no, no. But I did all the service to maintain the optimal level. You look at the guy and say, what a weirdo. Why do you have a new car if all you're going to do is maintain it? But subhanAllah, some Muslim is very happy to just do the maintenance on himself as a Muslim. Meaning to pray his salah, to fast, to give his zakah, make hajj if he has the ability to do so. And he doesn't see that he has to drive and go anywhere further. The car <clears throat> fulfills its purpose, it has to be maintained, don't get me wrong. If the car is not maintained, eventually it will not take you to your destination. Or worse, you may end up in an accident, you know, imagine if you don't service the brakes and the brakes fail you, you can end up in a deadly accident. So the maintenance of the car is extremely important, but it's not the end goal of what you want to do with the car. Eventually you want to start that engine and drive to your destination. And the roads and the highways that you will use are the paths that you're going to take using that vehicle to get to your destination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this body that He gave us, the maintenance of this body, to keep this body fit spiritually, to keep this body able to last, to make it to our destination, which inshallah is Jannah. The maintenance of this body is the salah, the zakah, the fasting in Ramadan, the hajj. But eventually, the road that Allah provided us to drive and to run with this body, the Salat al-Mustaqeem, which we're going to talk about later, it goes somewhere. It goes to Jannah, inshallah. And you have to get on the road and actually drive. You actually have to get on the road and move. You need to move forward. It's not enough to just maintain the vehicle. It's not enough to just maintain you know, this body. You have to do more than that. Allah expects more than that. I recall and I remember... When we spoke about ibadah here in the masjid, I broke down ibadah into a few different categories. One of them, which is what I'm going to highlight now as a reminder for myself and all of you, is there is an element of ibadah which is the ibadah of fulfilling your potential as a human being. Doing whatever Allah made you capable of doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given all of us unique abilities and talents. One of us has the ability to lead the salah in the masjid, teach others in the masjid, one has the ability to prepare the food to make sure the guests at the house of Allah have something to eat. One of us has the ability to plan some of the renovation projects in the masjid. One of us has the ability to do some of the renovation work in the masjid. One of us has the ability to do the landscaping and the gardening outside of the masjid to make sure the masjid looks neat and presentable. Everybody has a different ability, a different talent. Everybody has some potential. And part of ibadah, part of worshipping Allah, when we declare, we read Surah Al-Fatiha, what, 17 times a day, we say, Ya Allah, we're ready to worship you. Part of that declaration that we make in our Fatiha is telling Allah we're ready to fulfill our potential. We are ready to do what you made us able to do. Whatever talent and skill you gave us, Ya Allah, we're ready to use it. And it's very, very important that we keep this in mind, that when we talk about ibadah, when we talk about the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it goes way beyond just the five pillars of Islam. 
and please don't misunderstand me for one second. We are not saying that the five pillars of Islam are not important. As I told you guys, the example and the analogy of the car. The car needs its maintenance, but the car is meant to drive. We as Muslims, we need our spiritual maintenance, which is these pillars of Islam. But we are also meant to go out there in the world and serve humanity, serve our community, be a role model for our family, be an excellent ambassador of our beautiful deen for the society that is around us. All of this is expected of you. It's not enough that you just pray and fast and give your zakah and make hajj and say, you know, I did what I am able to do. You did not do what you're able to do. You didn't even fulfill the bare minimum of what you were able to do. Then, this is when we talk about the ibadah, when we talk about the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are talking about, you know, way more than just the obligations that Allah put upon us, way more than just the pillars of Islam. We're talking about genuinely fulfilling your potential as a human being in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just to conclude this point and move on, think about it for one second. You and me and every one of us as believers, what is our goal? Even the brothers and sisters who are watching at home, what is our goal? Our goal is to gain the pleasure of Allah. Is it not every Muslim is seeking the pleasure of Allah? How can you imagine Allah, you know, to Allah belongs the highest example. If you have a son or daughter and they are wasting their potential, how frustrated do you become as a human being, as a parent? To see your child, son or daughter, you know, not taking school seriously or not pursuing their career, not focusing on, you know, developing themselves and trying to better themselves. As a parent, as a mother or father, you become frustrated. You're not happy. What about Rabbul Alameen, our Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we want to gain His pleasure, don't you think He is watching and waiting to see me and you fulfill our potential? Or you think He is waiting and watching to see me and you excel at taking a nap? and drinking coffee. If that is your understanding then, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching and He is waiting for you and me and for all of the believers to fulfill their potential so He can feel satisfied and He can feel happy. Look what my abd, look what my creation has been able to do. It will not add anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor will it decrease anything from Allah if we don't fulfill our potential. We are our own loss. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy at the slave of his that excels and aims to fulfill their potential. This is iyaka na'bud and we say wa iyaka nasta'een. We seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek help only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Question for you guys. Are we allowed to seek help from others beside Allah? We have one idea is no. Any other opinions? Yes, it depends. Yes. What else? What do you think, Sheikh? No, good. We have brothers on one side united. What about the rest of the sisters? <laughs> Are we allowed to seek help from other than Allah? Yes. Who wants to explain? Either yes or no. <laughs> I like that. So those who said yes, Ustad is one of them. Who else? You said yes, right? Yeah. What? Why? Or how? Very good, mashallah, excellent. Right? No, mashallah, sister explained, sister Enda explained very nicely. We believe that everything is coming from Allah, we believe that everything is in the hand of Allah, but we naturally ask each other for help as needed. So, what is happening? This concept in the Arabic language is called isti'ana, and this is an act of worship. It's, uh, Ibadah of the heart. Okay? 
That is that the heart of the Muslim, inside the heart of the Muslim, he or she, they are fully convinced that the one who is in control of my affairs is Allah. The one who has the power to change my situation is Allah. The one who can rescue me is Allah. The one who can remove this sickness or this calamity from me is Allah. But that action of the heart should not be mixed with the actions of the body and the tongue, which is that we seek help from one another as needed. Right? Then there's a joke to illustrate this. There's a, it's a joke, it's not a true story. There's a guy who they say he was drowning. He was in the ship and something happened, he fell overboard, he was drowned. And he called out to Allah, he said, Ya Allah, save me. And so the people, eventually they were able to locate him and they threw him a rope to tell him, hold on to this and we will pull you back on board. He said, no. I called upon Allah, I only seek Allah's help. He said, okay, weirdo. And they moved on. And then the story goes, he was still struggling, he was still drowning. Some other group of people passing by, they saw somebody struggling and he is calling for help, calling Allah for help. They reached out their hand, they said, hey, come. He ignored them, he said, I'm calling Allah only, alone. I seek only Allah's help. It's a joke, it's not a true story. They, they say some jinn or somebody came and told him, they said, what? You think Allah is going to send Jibreel to rescue you? Like, you asked Allah for help, Allah sent you these people to help you. Take the help and move on, right? So the idea here, this is what the scholars of Islam teach us, that the action of the heart of the Muslim is that we have full trust and full dependency upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But with our hands and with our tongue, we seek help from one another. I asked the brother for a ride, you asked the brother to borrow his, I don't know, whatever it is that you want to borrow from him, his phone. The other person will ask somebody for help to turn on the lights or turn off the lights or turn on the fan or turn off the fan. We may ask somebody to borrow money, etc., etc. Then you can ask, no problem. You can seek somebody's help by your hand, no problem. But in your heart, who is your savior and who is the one who has the power to change your condition? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To a level, you know, as Muslim, if we seek somebody's help, if we need help, we make dua, we ask Allah. Let's use a simple example. Somebody needs financial help. They need $5,000. They ask Allah, Ya Allah, provide for me, help me to get out of this calamity. And then they go and ask their brother and say, Habibi, can I borrow $5,000? The brother says, no. What happens? Does that affect the heart of the believer? Does the believer now start to feel that Allah is not there to take care of me? No. Maybe that brother's hand didn't extend to help you. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause somebody else's heart to open up and they will extend their hand to help you. Then these two things should not be mixed. The heart of the believer is fully reliant on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But our hands and our tongues, we communicate with each other and we seek help from one another. By the way, this is for you, Masagun. If we went with your opinion that we cannot seek help from others beside Allah, then fundraising in the masjid will be banned. <laughs> Think about it, right? And we all know that we need to fundraise to survive. Don't worry guys who are watching, don't turn off the screen. We're not turning this into a fundraising event. It's just a joke, right? But in essence, in reality, think about it. The Prophet ﷺ, he sought help from people around him many times. The Prophet ﷺ, the easy example is coming to my mind. When the Prophet ﷺ was making the hijrah from Mecca to Medina, he sought the help of a non-Muslim expert who was very skilled in traveling through the desert. And there are many, many other times that the Prophet ﷺ asked for the help of his Sahaba. In the battle of Al-Ahzab, the Prophet ﷺ had his army, his Sahaba, and they were you know, busy digging the trenches and they were working hard and they almost missed the Asr prayer and they prayed the Asr. And the Prophet ﷺ asked, he said, who has you know, food, who can provide dinner for me and my companions? And one Sahabi, he came quietly to the Prophet ﷺ, it's a nice story. He came quietly to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, O Messenger of Allah, my family has some food and I'll get them to prepare it. But please, you know, pick few of the closest Sahaba to you and bring them with you to my house. The man he intended 
that a handful of people will come. He sees the Prophet ﷺ with an army of 1,000 people. He says, I can't feed 1,000 people. I'm just giving a number as an example. So he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, the few close Sahaba to you, maybe Abu Bakr or Umar said, no, Uthman, these handful of few Sahaba, bring them with you to my house and my family will prepare the meal for you guys. This is after Asr. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? He turned around and he said, Oh, Jama'a, so and so is preparing dinner for us. Get ready, we're going to his house. The guy was like, what, what to do? I have the, all, all the Muslimin are coming to my house. Where are they going to sit? Where are they going to fit? Where is the food going to be? And so he rushes home and he tells his wife, he says, the Messenger of Allah and the army are coming. He said, are you out of your mind? Army is coming to eat what? And she explains to him, she says, we have one goat that we can slaughter and we can prepare the meat and we can make some bread, but who's going to feed the whole army? He said, I don't know, but this is what's happening. I'm just coming to let you know. And so they do what they have to do at home. And the Prophet ﷺ, he comes with his sahaba and he tells the companion who offered the dinner and his family to, and this was from the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the miracles that he performed in his life. He said, when you guys are done cooking the food, you know, keep the pots covered and keep it in the home. And I will send groups of people. You know, they will come in batches to get their food and go. And he said, don't serve anyone. Don't touch anything. And the Prophet ﷺ, you know, with the pots covered with his blessed hands, والسلام, he opened and he took some meat and he gave everyone their share. And the story goes that it didn't run out until the last of the companions came and took their share. And then there was enough left for the family to eat after he was gone, alayhi salatu wasalam. This is, as I said, from the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. Please don't try this at home. I say this, and you guys are laughing, but I'll tell you, wallahi, I'll tell you a true story. I remember, I kid you not. You know, you see amazing things in, in the masjid. We were very young. And we were in the masjid, our local masjid, Brampton Islamic Center, where we used to study. And it was, that was in the summertime. So we were all off school. We used to have Quran class in the summer from 9 until 2, till Dhuhr. And there used to be some other guys who used to come for class in the evenings from 5 to 7. And summertime, Maghrib is obviously late, so we would be in the masjid after Dhuhr. Many times we would even stay back and we would go play soccer after that. But this one fine, they were all young kids, right? So everyone puts their money together, two dollars each, and we ordered pizza. We ordered pizza, and whoever coordinated it and ordered the pizza, eventually the order, or maybe the money was less, I don't know what the story was, but we ended up with less pizza than we needed. So imagine we had 20 guys trying to eat pizza, and there was two boxes of pizza. This is like, what are you going to do? Everyone wants three, four slices. How is this going to work? But wallahi, I kid you not, one of the guys who was older than us, we were in the, well, there's a room in the masjid at the front, and that's where we used to eat. This guy, me and a few others, we figured out that this was like insanity, but we didn't say a word. We said, let's watch and see how this goes. The brother, he said that we're going to practice the sunnah of the Prophet <laughs> And I kid you not. And he took the two boxes of pizza, and he put it under the table. And he kept the box closed. And he insisted. He was older than us, so we couldn't resist. He insisted he kept the box closed. And he told everyone to come and take a slice and go. And then in the end, when it was finished, he said, see the barakah. It worked. So then I couldn't hold it. I couldn't control myself. I said, yeah, it worked. Everyone got one slice. <laughs> Right, so I bursted his bubble, but he really thought that, you know, he followed the sunnah and he practiced <laughs> what the Prophet ﷺ did and it worked. But, you know, the reality was, yeah, if we're all going to get one slice, of course two boxes is going to be enough. It's not going to be a problem. Al-Muhim, back to Surah Al-Fatiha. We say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Allah alone is the one we worship and He alone is the one who our heart relies on and depends on. Fun fact for you guys. Up until this point of Surah Al-Fatiha, a human aql can figure this out. The tools and the ability that Allah gave this mind is able to figure out that Allah is the Lord of the heavens and the earth, that Allah is most merciful, that Allah owns everything, that we should worship Allah and we should seek help from Him. 
this is the limit of where the human mind can reach in comprehending Allah. And that is why immediately after this, what did Allah teach us to say? Because without the guidance, means guide us to the straight path. Without the hidayah, without the guidance, a human being can reach that level of recognizing Allah and appreciating His favors and knowing the greatness of Allah. Let's prove this. Sayyidina Muhammad before he received the revelation, he reached this level. By going and spending time alone and thinking about the creation of Allah and thinking about his maker and thinking about the misguidance of his nation, he reached a level of appreciating Allah for who he is and recognizing the greatness of Allah. But now that you recognize the greatness of Allah, you need guidance how to serve Allah, how to worship Allah, how to obey Allah. And that is why after all of this comes the verse that Allah taught us to seek guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same goes for Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, I spoke about this in the khutbah of Eid. As a young boy, he figured out that there is one Allah who created everything and he must be the one who created me if he created the heavens and the earth and he must be all powerful and he's the one who we should worship. So his own intellect brought him to the conclusion that there is an Allah who is almighty, who is superior to all beings around. But what to do to obey that Allah, what to do to gain the pleasure of that Allah, now guidance is required. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He made it you know, easy for us as Muslims, because we already believe in Allah and His Messenger, then we know these things. We know about Allah being the Lord of everything, being the most merciful, being the owner of everything. We know that we want to worship Him and we want to seek His help. But somebody who is not even a Muslim, these things they can figure it out. If the aql is sound, if the mind is clear, if the mind is focused on finding the truth, it will reach this conclusion. But beyond that, you will need guidance, right? And just something that you guys maybe can relate to. How many a time have we met or heard? Is it really Maghrib time? Because we can stop if it is. Is that the, the, the time? Mississauga time. Then we'll give it two more minutes, inshallah. How many times have we met or have you guys heard of a new Muslim who, when they take the shahada, they tell you what they say? We knew this was the truth a while ago. It just we were looking for the guidance. We always believed in one God, but we were searching for how to worship Him. We knew that there has to be a creator who wants us to worship Him, but we didn't know how. Right? So what, what does all of this prove? That human beings, if they actually think, they're actually interested in knowing about Allah, they will reach a certain level. But what to do with knowing Allah? Now you need guidance. It's not enough to just know Allah. You need to have guidance of what to do to worship Allah. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us to say, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. What is the straight path? Sarat in the Arabic language, by the way, there are many other words in the Arabic language for roads or paths or ways. There is the word Sabil in the Arabic language. There is the word Tariq. Right? Those of you who went to Saudi Arabia, you will see, you know, you have seen or you would have heard the word Tariq. Um, in the modern Arabic, they use the word Shari' uh, for street or for road. Right? There are many words in the Arabic language for a path or for a road. Allah chooses throughout the Qur'an to describe His path as Surat. The most beautiful uh, reference for this is in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلُ Allah says this is my path, the straight path, and He calls it Surat. And then he says, don't follow the other paths because you will divide among yourselves. But he calls the other paths subul from the word sabil. Or subul and sabil. And it's interesting because Allah is in one sentence talking about path and paths. And here he uses one word, there he uses another word. So why did Allah call his path sarat? 
the scholars of linguistics, they say that Sirat is the shortest point or the shortest distance between a place and its destination, meaning the shortest road to get where you want to go. The path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the easiest and it is the shortest and it is the fastest, most effective and efficient way for you to gain success in this dunya as well as in the akhirah. You and I have a goal in life, which is we are on this highway, we are on the Salat al-Mustaqeem, and our exit is where? Our exit, inshallah, is Jannah. How to get to Jannah? It is following this Salat al-Mustaqeem, following this path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this straight path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we'll close with this, inshallah, in the Quran, He invites us... Uh, to his path Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites us to his path and something for you guys to think about if I invited you to my house I invite you to my address right you invite me to your house you will give me an address nobody invites you to the street or to the road of their house we will ask we'll say what do you mean can anybody, what's the name of this? Trafalgar, right? Imagine if we told somebody the address of the message. So the message is Trafalgar. They say Trafalgar what? Which you can easily get lost by the way. Trafalgar, this side, that side, up, down. Where are you going? We need to give people addresses. We give people fixed location. This is where we invite people to. Allah is the only one who invites you to a road without giving you a destination or a fixed address. This is very interesting. Think about it. No other human being will accept that you try to visit them and you made it to the road of their house, but you didn't make it to their house. Imagine somebody is, I don't know, any example. Somebody is sick maybe, for example, you call them, you make an appointment, you say, I want to come and visit you, I have something to give you, that. And then eventually you don't make it to the house. When the guy calls you the next day to say, what happened? I thought you were coming. He said, yeah, well, I made it to the road. Alhamdulillah, I made it to the road, but I didn't come to this door. You will say then, why did you call me to make an appointment? Allah is the only one who invites people to a road. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy if you make it to that road. Why is that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not looking at the, there's no, you know, fixed point or fixed location that me and you have to reach. Allah will be happy with us if we die traveling on Sirat al-Mustaqim. We may not reach the ultimate Iman. We may not reach the ultimate level of Taqwa. We may not succeed as the best believer. But as long as you die and you return to Allah while you were on the Sirat al-Mustaqim, you will be successful. Why is that? Why does Allah invite to a road without giving you a fixed address? Allah is the only one in the world that will accept your effort and is not concerned with your results. Can you imagine, is there any boss or manager in the world who will accept, he asks you about the deadline that you had to meet and he says, what happened? Did you complete that task that was due yesterday? And you tell him, Wallahi, I tried my best. I really worked so hard. He will tell you, are you done? And you say, no, I'm not done, but you won't believe how hard I worked. So the door is there, right? In this world, nobody accepts effort. Nobody will accept your effort. Even your, subhanAllah, even your own family, the husband to the wife or the wife to the husband will not accept that. Imagine the husband is looking for his dinner and he asks the wife, is there food that I can eat? He says, you won't believe how hard I tried to make the dinner, but few things happened, so there's no dinner tonight, but I really tried. We say, are you joking? What, what are you trying to explain to me? Is there's nothing to eat? No, there's nothing, but I really tried. Nobody will accept that. They'll say, how does this make sense? This person has lost their mind. And the other way is also true. Imagine the wife is expecting something. The husband has to buy something. And he starts explaining, no, 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 I, I really wanted to buy it. I would have loved to buy it. I tried to buy it even, but uh, when I got there, then I got distracted and I forgot and then I didn't buy it. And that's why I'm here now. You say, then go buy it and come back. That's the only way we'll accept this, right? 
So no human being will accept your effort if you don't deliver results. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited to his road, he invited to his path because Allah doesn't care about the results. Allah is concerned with your effort. As long as you are on the path and you are traveling towards him, Allah is happy with you. And this works only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll stop here inshallah and we will make a run and get ready for Salat al-Maghrib. I would offer you guys to ask questions if you can or if you want to, but there is simply no time. We will continue next week inshallah and hopefully next week we will conclude Surah Al-Fatiha and then we'll move on to the other adhkar of the salah. Jazakumullah khair for the good of listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. Until we meet again next time, enjoy your evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.